Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate being able to be here at Chapman University Economic Students Association. And um, by the way, your professor, Professor Pico Ayer, is going to have a presentation called Global Souls, April 10th, that deals exactly with what I'm talking about. That'll be here on campus in the next few days. Uh, I'm going to talk about my new book, California's Next Century, which talks about how to get California out of the recession. Some of the specific economic concepts that are covered in there, and I want to make sure I hit them off the top. The Optimum Currency Area by Robert Mundell and how California is not the beneficiary of such a situation with America. The fact that distance increases the cost of business, as originally described by Adam Smith, and how this works against California. The new international emerging global economy of the next century, as discussed by Thomas Paul Krugman. And the fact that international stability equals business stability. In addition, I'll be presenting a plan to cut taxes here in California by 30 to 50 percent. And I will also be discussing the competitive advantage of nations by economist Michael Porter. Um, so what is the plan for California's next century? Um, by the way, what you're going to hear in the next couple minutes is going to be very radical. Everything is well sourced in the book. I'm trying to build publicity now. I received a positive review by LA Weekly, reporter Tom Elias, in addition to San Francisco Book Review, Midwest Book Review. 25 California university professors are agreeing to a book review in addition to four different California think tanks, Claremont, Milken, Pacific, and Independent. So there's something to this, although I'm still working to establish credentials. So here's the plan. We can make California the richest country in the world. So for the last 30 years, California's been going downhill from this supposedly golden era. And there's a lot of statistics to back that up. If you look at roads, dams, bridges, schools, levees, airports, seaports, you name it, according to the federal government, California has the worst of all 50 states and has had that for decades. So for about 30 years, we've had the worst of every single type of infrastructure, according to the federal government, in addition to schools. And this has gone on and on. And perhaps some of you may have heard about talk about how we're, oh, what's the best way to put it? Liberals with no fiscal discipline, bleeding heart, we always have to fund social programs, and that's why we have deficits, and that's why we can't balance our budget. I'm here to tell you, and it's documented in the book, we don't have a money problem in California, and we've never had a money problem in California. Don't have it. We have money taken away from us that is our money, and that's why we have the problems that we do. We make enough money, we pay our bills, and then we lose cash through a series of siphoning actions, which I'll explain. And that's why you have ghettos and poor schools and bridges that collapse and the worst road system in America and airports that can't be expanded, et cetera, et cetera. I'll touch on that in a second. So I'm going to stop top level and then come down. California's next century has to deal with improving the economics of California, but then also achieving opportunity for the new economy that's going to be growing in the next century. So in the next 20 to 40 years, there are going to be new superpowers with as much money and raw power as America. It's not that America is going down, but you have what's called the rise of the West. Other countries have figured out that capitalism and some form of democracy is the way to go. And now they're pursuing them, and they are making money at record levels. In fact, the growth rate of the new superpowers is significantly higher than established powers such as America. So the growth of these new powers is going to actually exceed America and Europe in the upcoming decades and rocket them to a level on par with us. These new superpowers are going to be Russia, China, India, Brazil, America, and Europe still, and possibly a Southeast Asian collective known as ASEAN. What happened was that from 1945 until about 1990, the world was broken up into two spheres. Democracy and capitalism and communism on the other side. And people had kind of stark options. They could choose some form of liberal and free government or some form of government that had control over the economy and every aspect of their life. 
Well, most of the world sided with America during that period, from World War II until about now. But in the late 80s, early 90s, something happened. America became the victim of its own success. It won the Cold War. And now every country believes that capitalism and some form of democracy is the way to go. And that's why you have all of these other countries rocketing to wealth. A wealth that will match, if not exceed, America's in their future. By the way, EU already has more money than America. We don't talk about that. So that's an example of things that are going to happen. What happens in this upcoming future when America is only one of seven options for democracy and capitalism? It's only one model to follow. It's only one style of leadership. And in fact, there are six others. Competitive economies and some form of democracy. And they're saying, you know what, our way's better, don't go to the Americans. You want partners in the UN, you want loans, you want development, come see us. Already doing that. Here's what's happening right now. And by the way, we don't talk about this. So, China started a trend about 10 years ago. It's called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It's China's UN. They made their own UN, they invited all the neighboring countries to join, and specifically banned America from ever going to any meetings. Then Russia wanted to do their own. Then India wanted to do their own, and then Brazil. Who's heard of Mercosur? That is a trade organization throughout Latin America, controlled by Brazil and banning America. America came to Latin America a few years ago and said, let's have something called the FTAA, Free Trade Agreement of the Americas. That was going to include everybody. Brazil went to the other Latin American countries and said, don't do that, do Mercosur. By the way, America's never allowed in Mercosur. Guess what Latin America's doing now? It's not the FTAA, which America wanted, it's Mercosur, which Brazil wanted. So this is already happening where organizations, as they rise to become superpowers the size of America, are saying, you know what, we don't really like your UN, your IMF, your G20, your group of eight. We're going to go make our own. And then we're going to invite everybody that we want to join our group. And then we're going to make our own rules. And in Europe and America, you don't get to come to the party. So what happens when we expand this trend out 20, 30 years? Well, you don't have the UN anymore because nobody shows up. Or an IMF. Or a G20. Or a G8. The CIA released a study by the Atlantic Council, which is the research arm of the CIA called Global Trends 2020. And in that, the CIA says that the period that we're going into in the next 20 years is the most dangerous period that the world has ever seen since 1913. Anybody want to guess why? The CIA is saying that in the next couple of years, we're seeing new powers rise. They don't feel that they were included equally in the decision-making process like the G with the UN and the IMF. And there's something to that. There has never been an oversecretary or top leader of the IMF or the UN who hasn't been an American or European for 70 years. So when you go to India, China, Russia, Brazil, and you say, oh no, it's about you too, they're not buying it. The time to prove it to them was decades and decades ago. Now they're making their own game. And America has no credibility. Everybody knows that America's generally not well liked. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm saying that there's policy statements that have shown in the last couple of years because of foreign policy statements, most of the country, most of the world's nations don't have a positive image of America. I'm not arguing good or bad, right or wrong. I'm just saying is, by the way, that's thoroughly documented in the book according to multiple Pew International surveys from 2005 to 2010. You're already not well liked. You have new powers rising up. They're leaving your end your UN and your IMF, and they're making their own group, and they're banning you from coming in. How secure is America's future in the next 20 to 40 years? CIA says it's dangerous. CIA and the Atlantic Council in 2025 transformed future. They have had two versions of the document out in the last five years. Have said, go back to 1900s, early 1900s. Most of the world was owned by France and England and a couple other European powers. But then there were these new nations who became nations recently, and they wanted as much power and influence as France and England. 
And so they got their act together and they went out and started conquering pieces of the world. And for a while they worked with England and France, but then at some point they said, you know what, we're just going to do it our way. And they walked out of the League of Nations and then you had World War I and World War II. And those nations were called Germany, Italy, and Japan. And the CIA is saying that looking at new rising global powers who feel that they have not been franchised resembles that dangerous period from 1890 to 1913. I'm not saying that, the CIA is. By the way, we have absolutely no discussion in this country about this. Why? Because America built the UN and the IMF. It doesn't want to hear that the world finds them unfair and unreasonable and it basically failed them. Not a positive message. America wants to hear that the world is always going to want our leadership and they're always looking for us to provide the way. Uh-uh. New powers are rising. And they're given more money, and they're making their own organizations. So in the future, what you have is an America that's not well liked now, going into a future where there's now six other options. Are people going to go to America for business, for partnerships, for trade, for deals? Or are they going to go to other nations? Because America is perceived to sort of have this holier-than-thou attitude. Again, I'm not arguing right or wrong, good or bad. But if you were somebody, and you knew someone, and this person just acted completely arrogant all the time. And you needed a loan. And they were one of seven people you could go to for that loan. By the way, the other six people are really nice and saying, I want to be your friend. Who are you going to go to for a loan? Probably not the arrogant person. Who doesn't even recognize that they've ruined their reputation and has absolutely no discussion on how to fix it. By the way, this whole idea that the current president, Barack Obama, was going to fix the relationships with the Middle East. Hasn't happened. I got social surveys in there. The world is still just as upset. They are as pissed off as us at America as they were during W. Bush as they are during Barack Obama. Nothing's changed. So, enter California. It's not just bad for America that these places are pulling out of the UN and the IMF. It's bad for the world. You need a central diplomatic discussion where everybody has to feel like they come to the table and they work out their problems. Because when people do not sit at one table, they tend to get guns and then figure out how to shoot each other. I'm simplifying it, but that is the reason. So, the last 200 years, there's been a little place called Geneva, Switzerland. And if you look up all of the major diplomatic agreements and all of the major international corporate agreements, uh, sea access shipping, telephony, Red Cross, the first Geneva Conventions, they were all signed in Geneva, Switzerland. Everything. So most of your deals between all your nations, most of your deals between all your international corporations for the last 200 years were single-handedly worked out in one city. Not all of them. UN, IMF helped. But most of it was Geneva, Switzerland. In the last two years, the mayor of Geneva and the government of Switzerland have said that they can no longer hold their role as the diplomatic center for the world in the future. They're giving it up and they're walking away. And the reason is the world's changed too much. When the world was owned by mostly European countries 100, 200 years ago, France, England, Germany, Italy, it made sense to have a center of the world that was also in Europe. But now Europe will only be one of seven superpowers calling the shots. So now you need a new center for all of these new players. And here's how California is the only option. Switzerland worked because 200 years ago, the Swiss went to Germany, Austria, England, France, and Italy and said, we Swiss have a common identity but we're part German, French, and Italian in a group called Romance. They're like four different groups, but they think of themselves as Swiss. They've lived together for hundreds of years. So the Swiss went to Germany and they said, we speak German and we know your culture, we know how to talk to you, but we also speak French and Italian. And we are the living embodiment of all of you European people living and working together. So if you want to look for a place to have a neutral, natural negotiation nexus, it is us Swiss alone. We've literally walked the walk, talked the talk, we've done it, we've proved the point, and we know how to speak all your languages. It worked. 
They picked up English, but they already spoke German, French, and Italian. And that's why they were the center. And then Europe went to their, uh, who's seen the new Sherlock Holmes movie, second one that came out? If you watch that, they go to Geneva, Switzerland in the late 1800s to work out an international deal, and that's where Professor Moriarty's going to blow everybody up and stuff like that. So that's proof in, in common movies. Um, now, that won't work anymore. We need a new center that has what the Swiss did 200 years ago. But this new center is going to have to have Americans, Europeans, Indians, Chinese, Southeast Asians, and Brazilians all living together for over a century and working together and still speaking all those languages. Now when you add all those criteria together, your list of possible contenders for World Center gets shrunk like that small. Israel's a decent candidate. Israel has a strong European, American, Russian population. That's good. California has seven out of seven. And then it goes to Israel with three out of seven. So if we're looking at contenders, it's us and then a gigantic drop down to the next possible candidate. So what I'm offering to you is that you have options right now. The world is spiraling this way. We have no discussion about how these countries are leaving the UN and the IMF. It's not discussed. It's reported by the CIA, but you don't see any presidential candidates talk about it ever. California fixes the void. California becomes the new Swiss for the next century because it is literally the only place in the entire world that has the dynamic that the Swiss did 200 years ago to be the center for the next century. Real quick, let, let me finish and I'll with that. So, if we don't do this, then we're going to wait and see if we have World War III. Nobody has any solutions. Nobody's talking about this problem. And the number one way to make sure things fester and explode is to not discuss them at all. And that's exactly what we're doing. While this is rocketing ahead, we step forward, we have the option, we bring the world together, because by the way, we're the only place that has all these people living here together. We've had Indian and Chinese people and Brazilians living here for 100 years. I'm from Fresno. We've had a Japanese community for 125 years. I visited Nebraska, Maine, I went to Tennessee. They don't have diversity and they don't have anything remotely like this. It's us. We do this and then we get the economy of Switzerland. Switzerland has been the richest country in the world for the last 100 years, has had the highest social living standard for the last 200 years, and currently has zero unemployment during the height of this recession, and has been the most recession-proof economy in the world for the last two centuries. That is because it was the diplomatic and negotiation center. When times are bad, governments still have to work out the deals. They still have to come to the table. So this was a recession-proof economy. Deals were always worked out. They were always the center. Everybody know that uh, Hadron Collider, that giant circle thing where they smash atoms together? That's not an accident that's in Switzerland. The Swiss went to all the European countries and got them to jointly invest in the research center in Switzerland. That's why in the middle of the recessions, the Swiss still had money pumping in on the research project. When every other planet, I mean nation of the planets, cut all the research budgets. We can have the same thing here. And then we can be the richest country in the world, and we can never have recessions, and nobody that you know will ever go through what you're going through now, and we can lower taxes and increase services and fix all the problems that we have. Because this is a gigantic amount of money always coming in. What we're looking at is seven times the investment of America into an organization. That could be here. And the option is that if it isn't here, I'm offering that it's going to happen nowhere, and then you're going to wait and see what's going to happen. And by the way, it's going to be scary and horrible. That's not me saying it. That's multiple foreign policy scholars I have documented. I'll stop there and turn it over to questions. Let me just turn on the video real quick.